So shall we get started? Um, yes. want, before we get moving, I want to remind everybody that in the, the reminder that you got two hours ago, there was a link that goes to um, my Google Drive. I set up a separate folder for you that has, um, it has the two documents from last week, but it also had a folder that has the thing, the 13 items in it that Tom's going to be talking about today. So if you want to download those afterwards, if you didn't notice that, then go ahead and do that afterwards. Okay, it's now 1.30 and we're about to start on uh, the second session of Dr. Thomas Broussard's uh, talk on stroke aphasia and recovery. Uh, before he gets started today, we're going to have Nicole Leonard, our local stroke center coordinator, give us a, a, a review of the signs, symptoms of stroke and what we should do. Um, as she and uh, Megan Fry emphasized last week, uh, urgency is truly, truly important. The sooner we get to a stroke center or to emergency room, the, the more uh, therapy or treatment uh, options we have available to us, available to us, including um, I've, Nicole, you'll know, have to pardon me, but um, I, I put it maybe into rust terms, but we have the ability to suck the, the cot out of the brain. And we also have the ability to administer TPA but that really needs to be done within a short period of time. So without further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's welcome Nicole Leonard, registered nurse at the Shore Medical Center here in Easton, Maryland. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, as uh, Bob said, my name's Nicole. I'm the stroke coordinator for University of Maryland Shore Regional Health. So I'm happy and I'm glad to be here today to be able to talk to you all about stroke. Um, and for anybody that was here Last week, it may be a little repetitive, the information that I'm going to review, but I, I really think it's important and it's always good to touch on it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen. Um, and at the last meeting that we had, this was information that Megan shared, but I'm just going to do it all together today. So when we talk about stroke, um, one of the acronyms that we use to help us remember stroke symptoms is BFAST. And some of you may have heard of the acronym FAST. There's sometimes you can see out in the community posters that have FAST displayed on them or different cards, wallet cards that may have them. So the new acronym that we use is BFAST. So just reviewing each of these letters, if we start with B, that stands for balance. So any loss of balance, sudden onset of dizziness, um, someone may be leaning to one side or the other, could definitely be a symptom or a sign of a stroke. The E stands for vision or eyes for vision changes. So this can be any sudden onset of any kind of changes in your vision. So loss of vision, um, blurred vision, and it can be in one or both eyes. Um, we've had people before who have said, you know, they were right sitting down balancing their checkbook or maybe they were on a computer and suddenly they lost part of their vision or lost a part of their peripheral vision, um, so another sign of a stroke. And then we get into the FAST part. So F stands for facial drooping. So you could have drooping that involves your eye, your mouth, or both. You also could have a sudden onset of a severe headache. Um, the A stands for arms. So this can be weakness or numbness in your arms and or your legs. So usually it's going to be on one side of the body where you may get a very severe weakness where you're not able to move at all, or it could be a mild weakness, um, more dexterity or even numbness um, in your hand or in your arm. The S stands for speech. So this is any sudden onset of changes in speech. So this could be anything from slurred speech um, to what we're gonna talk I think more about today, which is aphasia. So. You may know what you want to say but can't get the words out, or uh, you could have something where you're not understanding what someone's telling you. And then the last one is T for time. So probably one of our, definitely one that we want to talk more about, and, and that's because if, if you ever have any of these signs or symptoms of stroke, um, any of these BFAST criteria, it's really, really important and key to call 911 right away. Um, and that's because we have two treatments um, for stroke. 
Um, but both of these treatments are very time sensitive and require that you get to a hospital right away. Um, so stroke is considered a medical emergency and two of the acute treatments that we have are um, IV alteplase and mechanical thrombectomy. Um, IV alteplase is a medication that will go in um, and it's going to bust up that blockage that's causing your stroke. So sometimes it's referred to as a clot buster. So I'm just going to move down on my screen to show you this slide that talks about ischemic stroke. So when we talk about ischemic stroke, um, it means that there's a blockage in a blood vessel supplying blood to the brain. So the blood isn't able to get where it's supposed to be going. Um, and that, in turn, is what causes you to have those symptoms of your stroke. So Alteplase's job is to go in and bust up that clot so that the blood can start flowing again. Um, the other option that we have for stroke, ischemic stroke, is what's called mechanical thrombectomy. So this is where a physician is going to go in with a catheter. They will thread it through a vessel in your body all the way up to your brain and actually pull that clot out. Um, so they're going to actually remove it. The big thing with both of these, with alteplase and thrombectomy, is that they're very time sensitive. So we only have a certain time window that those treatments can be done. So calling 911 is really, really important so that you are getting where you need to be and getting the treatments that you can um, possibly have really quickly. Um, so when someone calls 911 with stroke symptoms, the EMS providers that will come and see you um, are going to have certain processes and protocols in place that they're going to do, and they're going to take you to a designated stroke center. And when they're on the way, they're going to give the hospital a heads up that we are coming with someone that is displaying these signs or symptoms of stroke. Um, and then that hospital, in turn, that is a stroke center, also is going to have processes and protocols in place that they're going to be ready for you as soon as you arrive to the hospital. Um, so there's going to be a team of people waiting, ready for you when you arrive there. Um, to give an example of what we do here at Easton, a physician is going to meet you at the door. They're going to assess you right on the stretcher, um, and then they're going to go with you or with a nurse to CAT scan. So we're going to start getting some of those images that we need, um, get all those complete, and then bring you back to the emergency department. And then at that point, there's another whole team of people that are going to come in and be doing a lot of things at once, again, all with the goal of treating the stroke because it's a medical emergency. Um, and the best way to describe it, if you're for someone trying to visualize it, is really if anybody knows NASCAR, if you think about NASCAR and they have their pit stops. So the race cars go into their pit stops, they get fueled up, they get tires changed, everything that they need. Um, essentially, that is very similar to what happens with our stroke alert processes that we have. So you're going to have a lot of people coming to you at one time, um, a physician doing assessments, nurses, there's going to be a nurse that does a very focused neuro assessment. Um, we have people from the lab who will draw your blood. Um, we have techs that are going to be doing an EKG to look at your heart rhythm. Um, we also consult with University of Maryland neurology team because they help in that decision-making process. So it really is, we always tell people when they come in, it's going to be a lot of things happening at once. Um, but again, we all have that goal of just wanting to make sure that we're getting you the treatment that you may need as quickly as we can. Um, so if, if you take anything away, I'm just going to go back up to this slide. Um, please remember the symptoms, those BFAST symptoms, and just remember to always call 911 right away. Um, don't wait, you know, some people say, well, maybe I just want to take a nap and things will get better or this will go away, and you definitely don't want to do that. You want to call 911 right away, um, get yourself to the hospital, uh, so if there are any of these treatments, that so we can get those started and going. Nicole, last week yeah, we covered some of the symptoms that we might notice in our loved ones and also signs that we may notice on our own, and I know you have those there and we're handing people will have copies of those, but can you go through that again? Sure, yeah, so this slide, and this is one of the um, packets that will be sent out, gives you some examples of things that you may sit, see in your loved one um, to better describe these symptoms. So when we talk about 
the loss of balance or dizziness. Things that you may notice are someone is wobbling around. Um, we have had people say it looked like they were drunk because maybe you're not standing upright or you're leaning to one side or the other. Um, for the vision changes, you may notice that someone is squinting or rubbing their eyes, saying that they're not able to read as well. Um, for the facial drooping, again, you can ask some to, someone to smile um, and you can see if their face is drooping on one side or the other. And again, you can see it in the eye and or in the mouth. Um, for weakness, it says when you're wanting to sit or lay down, you have difficulty doing simple tasks. So things that you normally would be able to do or not have trouble doing, even walking, may become more of a challenge. Um, for speech, the trouble speaking, sentences you may not be able to understand what they're saying. You may find it difficult to have a conversation with someone, um, or you may notice too that they the person looks like they're not understanding what you're saying to them. They look confused where they normally wouldn't be. Um, so just some examples of different things that you may see or notice in someone else that would alert you, you know, hey, I probably need to call 911. This could be symptoms of a stroke. Are these typ typically additive? Or for example, if somebody has a severe headache, would that make you assume that's a stroke? Or would you expect to see a, you know, vision change or something else along with that? So, yeah, that's a good question. And every stroke is different. That's a good thing to remember too. Um, no two strokes are really gonna be the same and, and no two people may have the same symptoms. So it could be that someone only has one of these symptoms or it could be that someone has a combination of you know several um, symptoms all at once. So no two ones are gonna be the same. Thank you, Nicole. Well, it's uh, time to introduce Dr. Thomas Broussard, who is not only a nationally known and well-recognized stroke uh, recovery and aphasia uh, expert, um, but also uh, has just celebrated the anniversary of his first catastrophic stroke. So without further ado, Dr. Thomas Broussard. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will share and we can get, can get started. Once we get to the share, make sure that's okay. Okay, can everybody see this? It's all working? Is it working, Bob? It's working. Sure. Okay, good. Um, this is just the agenda and we're gonna go through a couple of things. Some of these uh, bullets will take longer than others. Some will go go by fairly quickly. Uh, but the first thing we wanna talk about is this um, exercise. So if you would like to, if you can, please write your full name at the top of a sheet of paper. That'd be the number one. This only takes a minute or two to do this, this uh, exercise, actually five minutes or so. But let me know since I can't see from here, but let me know uh, when you look like you have most people have done that. Done. Done. Looks like Annabelle, are you done yet? <laughs> She's done. Okay, let's move on. Looks right. like Rhonda's end is done too. All right. So the, and hopefully, what I didn't say before is hopefully everybody in today's class were at the class last week, because that would be helpful. Uh, but if you, if this is your first time, I will be talking about stroke and aphasia as we go forward. So I think you'll get most of the gist of things as we go forward. Uh, but in this particular case, with this exercise, um, you've now put your name with your normal uh, dominant hand. Now I want you to write with your other hand, your non-dominant hand, and write your name 10 times. So please go ahead and do that. Your other hand. As best you can.
Mine, mine's pretty bad when I'm riding with the correct side, but it's even harder the other way. <laughs> Tom, I'm a lefty. I'm looking at this handwriting and it's evident, and by the way, um, it's evident that if I had to eat with my right hand, I'd starve to death. <laughs> you look like, Tom, you look like you've been practicing this a lot. Oh, no, <laughs> nope, I, I made sure I did this, you know, just now or today? <laughs> well, I did this a while ago, yes, but I didn't practice. <laughs> In my case, it got worse. I thought I was doing better, paying more attention to it. And uh, maybe I tried to go too fast, but you see it got worse as I got uh, into the eight, nine, and 10. Has everybody pretty much done it? Pretty much? Still laboring on it, huh? When it comes to laboring and it's just your name, and then you get to get an idea of what we're talking about here. So the, the next question is, how did it feel? How does it feel with you to write with your other hand? It's painfully slow. Painfully Awkward. Slow. Awkward. Frustrating. Frustrating. Labor intensive. I'm sorry? Labor intensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. went through this about 10 years ago when I broke the other hand and I did have to do a good bit of writing and I wrote, looked terrible, but I wrote with the other hand. The thing I found the hardest to learn to do with my non-dominant hand was learning how to brush my teeth. Ah. That was very different. That was harder than writing. Wow. <laughs> Boy, it's, then it's a good thing I'm not doing the exercise with everybody brushing their teeth. <laughs> That'd be awful. We'd be brushing our faces. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it is true. It is really, really true. Assuming that you guys have all, even if you hadn't said it, you probably feel it. It was challenging. Arms get tired. Anybody feel anxious just about the whole thing? The fact that you had to do it? Yep. And here's some more. Took a long time, frustrated. Somebody already said that. Did you feel like you were holding your breath sometimes? Focused effort? Mm -hmm. Felt foreign? <laughs> yeah. The I did this, I started doing this a long time ago. So what you see in this slide have uh, put them all together from other people who have made their observations themselves. Um, and I do this, once it happened with me, I started doing this all the time. It is interesting that when we quote, learn something, um, if we have a lot of habit related activity, then we're not so worried. You know, we just do what we have to do. And we don't use any um, uh, 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 energy of which you are aware. You don't use any additional effort other than what you normally do, like when you're writing your name. There's no energy that goes into that. You've created that, that, uh, that habit, which turns out to be, of course, the, uh, the neurological uh, representation of your writing your, your name as one example, um, but as you read here, learning takes effort and depending on this little window, what I give you here, you get to see this window of the emotion and the energy that goes into learning something that you, A, never done before, and you're actually changing from what you've always done before. So the habit you used to do is in one place of your head, uh, although the other one is still in the in the same head, but the other one is way over here and it's never been used for this before in that particular way. So it becomes, as I say here, uncomfortable if not just downright irritating. And it takes a significant amount of, of activity. Uh, when I say here, the cortical representation, the neuro representation um, that gives you that perceptible window into how the brain actually actually operates physically. So you get to actually see it uh, in real time. So you got to see 
what what I've now just showed you is instead of using not just your dominant hand because there is a uh, 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 a neuro representation of your hand and your ability to write. It's, it is there and you learn on it every day and you grow things every day. But if you've always done it this way and now you have to use this one, it takes a lot. And because physically you get, you get to see it in real time. That is how learning works. And that is especially uh, for people who are learning something new, but they don't have a stroke that uh, it uses the same facility that we all have when we have lost our language and we have to uh, make our language get better. And it does require the same kind of effort that you've just seen writing with your non-dominant hand, except you have to do it as we just did it here for one or two or three minutes. You have to do that for hours, days, weeks, months, years to create the habit uh, and to create uh, and embed the uh, neuro network that goes into doing what you have to do to learn, relearn your language again. Um, these, so the next slide here, the enriched environment, um, what you really can see when you're looking at it is you're looking at those neurons right in front of you. So the ones on the left are the impoverished neurons, the ones on the right, the same, same neuron, on the right side are enriched neuron. What that really means is that all the, um, uh, the stimulus on either side, the, on the left side is there's less uh, stimulus, on the right there's more, otherwise we call them impoverished or enriched, but in either case, less means less, uh, meaning less dendrites, less synapses, and less ability to communicate and to deal with the connectivity that goes into how we move information through the brain and how fastly, how fastly, how fast we can move the information in our brain on the left side, as I'm calling it here, the impoverished, moving into a more enriched uh, environment, an enriched uh, set of stimulus that will grow uh, and enrich the neuron themselves <clears throat> so that now you have that ability, that new ability to communicate and build the connectivity that really is how the neurons work. Nothing happens on their own. It's all about the connectivity uh, of sending information between one cell to another, to another, to the um, muscles and so on. So now you can look at the enrichment side, exercise and all the kinds of things there are, again, they're not terribly um, dramatic. They are just what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but sometimes we don't, not sometimes, for most of us, in my case anyway, I didn't know that all of those quote activities, the list, things, the list that are there, um, as they make me learn one thing or another, I did, had no idea about how the brain works such that those activities, what we call the experience dependent activities, um, induce plasticity, which means you are inducing, you are creating additional neuro brain matter. Um, if you're not doing those things, those on the left, stress is at the top of the list. Even people who are making a presentation and they're just a little stressed to make their first step out on the stage and you feel that stress, that's how you can feel. Uh, and stress in all kinds of different ways really can affect you as well as all these other things on the left side. So it is really all about the connectivity uh, of the neurons and make the new, new, make the new connectivity based on the new dendrites and synapses, metaphorically those branches and leaves that allow the connectivity to, to work. Tom, yes. look, it looks like these, this is a good example of um, our lives prior to stroke as well. Oh, this is absolutely this. This is, this is, I don't have it written exactly that way, but yes, this is life, whether you have a stroke or not, on the right and the left. So this is what is happening to a person who wants to do one thing and you grow your brain better, cannot do the other thing for any number of reasons. Uh, obviously, we read about that in the newspaper every day. They are more impoverished neurons, and as a result, they are less able to communicate in any normal uh, situation 
not because of stroke or aphasia. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And all you have to do really is look at that, those cells in front of you, even without fully understanding it yet, you go, oh, that's how this works. So now we're going to talk, of course, we're going to move quickly into stroke and aphasia um, because you have lost um, millions and millions of cells from, from a stroke. They, the ones you're looking at there, you've lost those. Several millions of those cells are gone. The most interesting thing about all this is that the remaining cells that you still have, they have the capacity to grow dendrites and synapses and grow more of them. So the, the cells you lost that were lost and the dendrites and synapses that went with them, now at least you can grow more. How do you do that? In an enriched environment, and you have to be dedicated and put the focus on the exercise on the right side of this of this. Uh, a slide for people with stroke and aphasia, but yes, Lynn, all, everybody should be trying to work hard on the right side and not so much on the left, although we both obviously have both of those things on a day-to-day -day basis. But yes, good, good question. That's exactly it. Um, talk a little bit too about experience-dependent neuroplasticity. Um, you'll hear everybody talking about plasticity. It's really the same type of thing. Um, the, uh, but the longer term is experience dependent neuroplasticity because um, the to induce plasticity, meaning to stimulate plasticity, you have to have experience dependent activities. So that's why it moves in that direction. Um, and this slide, these 10 principles of experience dependent neuroplasticity um, are for anybody, whether you're healthy or not. So this is for you when you want to learn a new, new skill, new language, new activities, be better at baseball, basketball, you name it. It's all about plasticity. It is all about that. There is nothing else but that. Um, again, since we learned about photosynthesis when we were in third grade, we do not know, we are not been told, uh, and I, I don't know how we're going to make this happen other than introducing a class on plasticity so that even kids can go, oh, that's how, without necessarily knowing all of the details of this, but the same way we understand we convert light into green leaves, we want to convert uh, thought and cognitive activities into more brain matter, neuromatter. So that's how it works and that's how we should do that in school um, so that even, like I say, even just a little, so you can better understand how much more goes into how the brain works, even with just a little bit. And then these 10 principles, use it or lose it. And, and many times you actually have said this yourself, right? You're, you're playing basketball and, or, or anything and you haven't done it. You're learning a new language um, and you haven't done it for a month because you went somewhere else. So you couldn't practice that new language. Uh, yeah. Number two, use it and improve it or lose it or use it lose it. Those are the types of things that are mostly um, described by uh, folklore. I mean, it's just the way people think. But yes, there's a component, components of how we get better based on these activities. Um, the, uh, the, uh, say that word for me, Lynn. Specificity. Oh, there you go. Got to get it. Specificity. There you go. Um, Obviously, you have to be uh, have something in mind as opposed to nothing in mind, as it were. Uh, repetition is huge. Uh, intensity is huge, as you see here. Time uh, is uh, matters um, because clearly uh, there are certain stages of how the brain works and how the uh, uh, recovery works in terms of how the uh, it happens happens by nature before you get into more effortful need. Uh, for the activities, time does matter. Uh, soon after your stroke is better than three months or three years after your stroke. Um, but even with those different parameters, uh, you can still work off of that uh, again as well as you as well as best as you can. Uh, salience, of course, matters. Uh, age matters. Um, the younger brains have better ability than the older ones just because the age, uh, of the brain ages over time. Even a good, healthy person is losing cells as we get older. So that too has an issue. 
and transference and inference also have issues as well. But this is a good uh, citation. I encourage all the students uh, at the master's uh, school to really understand that and take it with them everywhere so you can better understand how it works. But that is those 10, 10 principles, which we refer to. Um, could you, you, could yeah. you give an example of the intensity? Um, oh, sure. The intensity is, let's say that, uh, a good example, um, the, we have conventional therapy, intensive therapy, and what I call enriched therapy. So if it's conventional, like me, I got 30 uh, sessions, uh, 15 hours, because there were 30 minutes each, twice a week for four months. That's, that is 15 hours. Intensive therapy, and actually to answer your question, intensive means that in um, between four to six weeks, not four months, that they will uh, create uh, about 150 hours within those four to six weeks. So basically every week for about 30 hours a week, that will be more intensive. So that's 30 hours a week of activity as opposed to in my case, one hour a week. 30 hours a week, one hour a week. That is what intensity is all about. And it's, I'll say it's huge. And it's, I'll say it's, it's also sort of unfortunate because it costs money to get into these intensive programs uh, because often the uh, insurance won't provide all of them, um, all of the cost of it all. Um, but if you are able, you likely will quote get better in those four to six weeks of intensive activity. Um, and that too, that's what we have to work on. We definitely have to make it better going forward. Tom, I think you made a comment last week too about when you are, in that therapy program right after a stroke that it's important to uh, be thinking about what you need to be doing afterwards and get guidance then from the professionals who can help guide that program of self-help? Yes, um, the, um, I don't have that slide here, but it's, it is un interesting because if you are, having a stroke and you're at the hospital, you're not obviously conscious of much, even if you are awake, um, you won't really understand what's happening yet. Um, but as you move into a, a, a therapeutic uh, act, set of activities um, and venue, then uh, again, that person, the patient won't necessarily be able to tell the, the uh, clinician, hey, we should set up a plan as, as if I really knew, let's just say it that way, as if I really knew, I would have said, okay, what's the plan? Because we're going to end here soon. What do we do to go forward? Since I won't be able to have been able to said that, say that, the clinicians, again, ones that I urge, to build that habitual therapeutic structure of the experience-dependent activities before leaving your, your conventional uh, formal therapy because it's really the, the habitual component of that, um, what you, you absolutely need, because otherwise, when you leave the therapist, now what are you gonna do? So you really need to help build that. And that could be part of the plan, uh, but it definitely have to build, build part of that structure. Go Is ahead. a spouse typically allowed in those, in those sessions so they can see what you're working on? Uh, well, uh, it, yes, it always depends, but. Um, if you're there for 30 to 45 minutes, you're typically actually doing those activities um, the, while you are there with them. The, the dependent component of that, building that structure, means that you have to also tell your patient, okay, when you go home, now instead of those one hours of, of formal therapy, now we want you to do 10, 20, 30. It all depends on how you are actually using the energy you currently have, because it took me a, a month before I could really do anything. And then you still get terribly tired for months and then even years. Um, so you can't really tell them, okay, do these 40 hours. But if you're only doing one and they say, well, I can do and come back with your little uh, diary and say, I did five things and it took me you know, three hours. That's still so much better than the one in terms of the, the intensity. It's been now, if it's three hours and it's three times more intense than the one. Um, so um, yes, building that structure is one thing. 
getting the clinicians to actually understand and provide the, the uh, baseline for creating that structure, that's, that's the next thing. That's what I am working on. Because it's not necessarily, um, um, it's not necessarily written about other than my work that this is what you should be doing. And when I say that, it's not like you could tell me that. They just have to do it and their family and the material so that when you finally get to that point, usually it's after the formal uh, therapy, now you move into your own uh, uh, um, uh, intensive set of activities of your own without the cost that it, that it takes to go to some of these other places. Yes, um, can, I, can I interject a minute? Um, sure, sure. Um, 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 thank you so much. This is um, also, the thing is that always have to remember that you have to be doing everything at the same time. You have to do physical therapy, um, uh, occupation therapy, and I'm sorry, I have a phase, and uh, speech therapy at the same time. And it's like Tom says, it's one hour and when you're in a clinician setting, but outside, it's like relentless. You have to try everything your whole brain has to be engaged just that sorry thank you <laughs> thank you Doreen since I can understand your voice I know your voice um and that is a what Doreen just said is a really good um summary of that uh because it is relentless it's not yeah. like it's not like something you want to have to do it's like telling you okay for the rest of your life you now have to use your other hand yes exactly when's that going to happen you know, you're going to run away. <laughs> um, so again, we're not telling people to run away. We're no. just helping them understand in the say, same way. Often, often, uh, we'll talk about it later too, um, uh, based on who they were before. Uh, that's also going to be a large part of this too. Mm -hmm. I'll go through this one quickly. Um, we talked about that, experience-dependent activities. We talked about that, converting. Yep, we talked about that. And yes, persistent, repetitive, cognitive, and language activities. That is the food. That is what makes it work. Now, of course, we talked about the title of this is the metaphor, which is interesting because we're sort of moving, not really moving off of, of um, the therapy component, but moving to an understanding that there's so much more therapy that comes as a result of what we, the people with stroke and aphasia, have done and can do going forward, um, a way above and beyond the formal um, conventional therapy. And using metaphors just happens to be one of those things, just happens to be one of the many things going forward. And most of these you all know about. Um, the metaphor is a figure of speech that directly refers to one thing by mentioning another. It provides the hidden similarities between two different ideas. Often, for those of you, I think I've said it before, obviously had my stroke 10 years ago, uh, saying this out loud for me is therapeutic because I don't get to do this that often to be able to actually read something, read this and say it out loud. So there's an awful lot of speed that goes into this too. And again, very helpful uh, and therapeutic. The word metaphor, oh, plus another time I had a presentation where one of my uh, friends in the audience, when I got all done, he said, sorry, I can't read anything. So Tom, can you please read it for me? And I told him from then on, I will continue to read it for people because they usually make them short. Uh, the word metaphor itself is a metaphor coming from a Greek term meaning to transfer or carry across. Metaphors carry meaning from one word, image, idea, or situation to another, linking them and creating a metaphor. And these are all well-known metaphors that everybody has seen. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. The, in my case, um, when I was at the very, very beginning of my stroke and was, I was trying to keep track of what was happening, um, I didn't know, I, I've said this before, I really didn't know how the brain really works. So I just assumed that there was a file cabinet in my brain that saves words, individual words. And uh, since I lost X amount of cells in my head on the inside, as an engineer, you know, 
A plus B equals C, I said, oh, so I lost so many cells, that must mean that I've lost some X number of words. I said that to myself on the inside. And I thought, okay, I will start this little experiment. And when I'm now starting to walk, I will start looking everywhere I can, looking at signs, looking at images, uh, 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 ideas, um, material, and see if I can't find, I must be able to find some words that are gone, right? They're gone. I went everywhere. This was on day one when I put it down and I wrote it in my diary, not that you can actually see what I was writing in my diary, but I wrote it and said, I can't find any words that are gone. I could see some are quote damaged, some are more difficult to see, say, even sometimes see a faint shadow of that word, but I could still see what it was and I could see everything in front of me. So I could see these items that I'm holding, whatever they might be. I might be, I couldn't pronounce some of those words or even come up with those words, but they were still there. And that's when I realized, oh, this is not just filing individual words. We file, file uh, individual molecules almost uh, that are made off of these cells, networks uh, that become bound such that they can become the neurological representation of that word, but it is scattered wherever it has to be in the brain, pulling all that information in an incredible, incredible device that we all have with those trillions of synapses, which is otherwise called the learning field. That's where everything happens, where it does that lightning going back and forth, going uh, in the brain. Um, so that is when I started realizing that uh, uh, I was looking for metaphors that can help me understand how the brain works without being told because I'd have to read a magazine or books about the science of the brain and I couldn't read, right? But you still have your intellect, you have your brain, you're thinking your way through. And I started thinking my way through how the brain works using metaphors that it turns out is part and parcel of how, of, of the stimulus that can help uh, build more brain matter because I had to think my way through this and come up with the ideas, which were often images of what I was trying to understand and come to understand that that is how it works. Or as a metaphor, it is very much what it works without having to read uh, the, the scientific literature. Although now I do read that as well. And I'm gonna give you lots of the uh, citations that you're gonna look at what I've been saying. Then you read theirs and go, yeah, it's pretty much what Tom is thinking. Same thing would happen with you. It's pretty much what time what people would think if they happen to have the uh, prior knowledge and the base for creating some of these metaphors. And now I'll I'll um, go through a bunch of these. Um, and as I say here, converting thoughts and cognitive stimulus into neuromatter. And that's how I started this. The um, now this one is a really good example. If two things happen, so this is our brain, it happens every day, it happens in flows, they call it flows, and there's some four billion flows a, a second uh, in terms of the way the brain works, and it's like lightning. Um, you saw it actually last, last week with that video, and it looks a lot like lightning. That's pretty much what it looks like. If two things happen at the same time in the environment, the individual may learn that the two belong together. These are cells. The brain basis for this might be what is sometimes called uh, Hebbian learning, a guy named Heb, um, learn nerve cells that fire together also wire together. When two neurons are frequently active at the same time, the connection becomes, becomes stronger. So uh, when it comes to repetition, um, and also when it comes to when you're playing basketball and you do that every day, and then you, for some reason, you don't do it for a month, it's gonna take a long time to pull everything back together again and be, become the basketball person you used to be. So these neurons do what they do and they wire them. When we talk about engraving this information, memory into our brain, when we talk about engraving, that's what we mean. We are actually wiring them together so that on a day-to-day -day basis, um, they stay connected and that makes them much, much stronger. And all these citations, well, you get to see all of them. And um, 
yeah, you should read all these. They're really amazing, these big people that uh, write what they've written. Um, Rosetta Stone. Um, if you might remember, uh, I know Bob and Lynn might remember, the last year when we started making these classes, I was hoping to have uh, my next book done by the, my 10th anniversary, by the 26th of this month. And with COVID and everything else, it will still be a couple more months. Um, but the book itself, which is around here somewhere, shows you a lot of these images. And right now, without knowing anything else, you get to look at that uh, Rosetta Stone and you go, oh, I remember that, you know, the, uh, the three languages that had to be um, uh, had to be translated between one, two, and three different languages going forward. Um, the, and it turns out, of course, as a metaphor, this Rosetta Stone is this clue that we all have for any number of things that we have to figure out uh, a, a problem that has to be solved. And persistent repetitive language activities themselves is the Rosetta Stone of aphasia recovery. If it isn't, if it isn't persistent re repetitive, you're not going to get as well as you would think you would if it wasn't that. And that is the Rosetta Stone of aphasia recovery. I'll read these out loud. Uh, on the neuro neurobiological of learning and memory suggests that for each new learning event, there is some necessary and sufficient change in the nervous system that supports the learning. So when you learn anything, as they say here, for anything, anything, if you have a sigh, um, anything, it builds a representation, a neurological representation that supports that learning, whatever it might, whatever it is, it just doesn't matter. Anything you think you're learning here today in this class, you're looking over here, you're looking at my tie, you think that's cute. You can, there's any number of things. An hour from now, if you happen to like this tie, you're gonna remember that tie. That means that to remember that time means that there is a change in the system, in the nervous system that supports that memory because of the way the brain works. Everything we know, knowing Bob's name, knowing Lynn's name, everything we find out in this one hour, everything comes with it, this, this representation that actually does present it. It just happens to be only with neurons. This neuroplasticity is itself driven by changes in behavioral, social, social. Sensory. Say it again. Sensory. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you. And cognitive experiences. In our view, this endogenous, endogenous, endogenous process of functionally appropriate real, reorganization in healthy brains is also the key or in promoting, to promoting reorganization of remaining tissues in the damaged brain. Really talking there about the fact that uh, whether you're healthy or not, we're using the exact same uh, principles. Sounds like defragging a computer. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That is true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Russian, Russian dolls. Everybody knows what that is for the most part. When we were kids, everybody has it. I have my couple of couple here in the house. Um, and we always think just because of that metaphor of this nested uh, idea of what is inside of inside of inside of each one of those things. Well, again, this is me on the inside. Everything what we're talking about are images I had in my head um, when I thought about the Russian dolls and thought, oh, there must be more to this fact that in the beginning, there was reading, writing, and speaking that were difficult, uh, that they were the deficits of my modality, my three principal my modalities. What I didn't know was that, that all of these skills and deficits were all nested such that, such that if you think you can read, write, or speak, well, you can't just do that. Beneath that are all these nested um, uh, processes that lead up to being able to read, write, and speak. And I said here, and I actually wrote that in another one of my earlier books, nested deficits seem to appear in the process of disappearing with more practice. What that meant for me, and you'll see here too in the next quote, I 
could actually start to see that I had additional deficits. And as I became to see them as deficits, I could also see that they were disappearing, meaning they were getting better and I wouldn't necessarily see what I couldn't have seen before. I only got to see what I couldn't see before because they were deficits, because I became more aware and they were going away. So I couldn't see them anymore with more practice. That's me writing about that with one of my earlier books. And now you get to see how it does work with these nested skills and deficits going forward. As it says here, the deficits are buried deep in the nested dolls of our language. The physical basis of the informational operations performed by the nervous system resides in the ability of the ner nerve cells, neurons, and their oxyac, oxen. Oxonic. Oxyx. Is that oxonic or dendritic? Yeah, something like that. It's the oxen. <laughs> oxen ick and the the the, the oh um, there you go okay. and the the um dendritic dendritic processes mm -hmm. to produce transmit integrate propagate impulses through the complex neuro neurological neurological network no, no, no. yeah i know i gotta keep working on this of course i did write another article too when you look at my website you'll see that um I wrote a whole article about why it's very important and therapeutic for us to, 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 to tell the per people um, about my problems, as it were, my, my deficits, and to have them to tell me what they are. So I get to hear it back and forth, back and forth, providing me with the feedback that I wouldn't otherwise get if I was just reading this to myself, right? It's almost impossible <laughs> for me to say it to myself that I'm making these mistakes, as opposed to you saying it for me. So yes, that's why I do this. I want to make sure that I'm as damaged as I can be so others can see it and I can learn from it. <laughs> I know. Some I'm otherwise what I call chosen. it. Huh? Some of us would have chosen simpler words. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, you know. But you're not cheating, so that's good. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I'm, 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 I'm what I often refer to myself as I'm just an idiot PhD guy, you know? I'm just doing the best I can. Um, yeah. Um, same thing here. I say same thing. They're all the same thing in my head. Um, knitting. Um, you know, and I know, and we all know, uh, because of so many people that knit and they knew they knit unconsciously. They just do it. And it keeps on going while they're having conversations, while they're playing chess. I mean, it just keeps on working. Um, and that is exactly the how the way the brain works to the degree that you can continue to do those activities, which is the knitting, and they become habitual, uh, that is knitting. And once you have a, the habitual um, uh, network running, then you find your way to, as I say here, you unconsciously knit the, the difficult to find words like those that we just talked about. Um, uh, and when I go home or when we're done here, I'll go back to those words that you just talked about and I'll go back to the uh, online so I can have them pronounce it for me on, on the computer. Um, but the more I do that, the more it becomes knitted into what I otherwise can't find. So when it comes to plasticity and having a stroke and recovery, uh, you can't quote, tell the person, okay, do these 10 things and do them all the time what you have to do is cre help create that structure of what they used to do in their previous life. If they were knitters, great. If you're building ships, fine. But you have to understand how any of us have tried to create these metaphors that you can find out more about the brain without reading about it in, a, in scientific literature. And then you find somebody like me who reads about it too. And then I, as I say here, the language is woven into actions, just like we talked there about the um, uh, 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 knitting. The tight and rapid link between language and action processes, because they are highly, highly integrated between language itself and the actions themselves, um, <coughs> at the level of the cortex has implications for language therapy. If language and action representations are strongly connected with each other, or to use a particularly plastic phrase once coined by the philosopher Ludwig 
Wickenstein. Um, Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein. Yeah, it sounds good. Wittgenstein. Oh, oh. Language. Oh, Wittgenstein. <laughs> there you go, with an accent. Is woven into actions. It, 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 it will be possible to activate one by activating the other. Um, it is woven into so much that even if, this is out again with people with stroke and aphasia, even if you can't say the word or say the activity that you wanna do on the inside, if you actually say it up here, the activity component of that, because they're so woven into, you will actually start working as if it was doing the thing you wanna do. So if you're reading and you can't, but you tell yourself, I want to read this, the brain starts reading, even if you can't express or understand what is happening. They are so completely interwoven, as it were. Um, so that to me tells me it is not unlike, you might've done this uh, experiment they've done over the years. I use basketball again. Um, uh, the, uh, they had a, a, a test, basically, the kids that were practicing and playing basketball, then they would check and see how well they were, they were playing, uh, uh, making bas baskets. And then the people who would just think about it, they wouldn't do anything. They would just think, okay, here's what I do. I pick it up, I hold the ball, I hold it a certain way, and I release it, but you don't do anything. And they did that study, and they said the people that were thinking it did better than the people who were doing it, right? So it is completely interweaven in that way, woven into. Again, this is how a person with stroke and aphasia gets better, even if they're not able to express what they wanna say yet, the fact that they are actually trying to express what they wanna say is, as I say, half the battle because the brain does what it does. It even sees some of that feedback and it's working hard to make this happen, even if you're on the outside, still can't get to the point of being able to express what you otherwise is thinking is happening on the inside. That's, to me, that's pretty amazing. Every day, to me, this is pretty amazing. Um, princess and the P, when it comes to habit. Um, yeah, these little things can make a huge, huge difference. Um, you have, you actually have, uh, there's a 13 images we're looking at here. You have 13 articles. And if you read each of these, you'll see a whole lot more information of how it is that I fought my way through this. So everything you see, you're gonna see this in those articles, um, which is helpful. Um, and here with the habit and the princess P, uh, those actions which appear the most insignificant if only they are constantly repeated, will form for us in the course of, of weeks or months or years an enormous total which is inscribed in organic memory in the form of irradicable habits. I'm not gonna try that again. Irradicable? Pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Somebody else say that for me. In irradicable. Irradicable, okay. It sounded just as good as me or as bad. Um, the, um, uh, the it, yeah, so even the habits, whatever you had had before your stroke, an awful lot of your recovery has to do with who you were before. And that too is another one of the gaps uh, because nobody's really gonna talk about what you did before when you get in with your uh, venue, the therapeutic venue. They might say, what do you used to do? Oh, you did this, this, and this, but there isn't any in-depth in depth, uh, uh, learning by the clinician about the patient in front of you. Because if you were to understand more about that, then you understand what the headwaters of the habit is that they had before that now has to just uh, leap over the stroke event and now use those same habits before to build this, this habitual structure going forward. Um, and if we, the, if you, the clinician, learn more about the, the uh, life of the person in front of you, then that can help both of them understand that if you do these things after building that structure, that would be very helpful going forward. And that is the habit that becomes the princess uh, uh, P, as it were. The, um, this here, a lot of you have probably been to the um, Montessori, I'm sorry, not Montessori, to, uh, Jefferson's house, Monticello, right? Um, and you can actually see that there. 
um, I was always trying to figure out why it is that we do so much work on the outside and creating this representation on the inside. And I came across this when I was there last year or the year before and realized that uh, Thomas Jefferson was doing exactly what we are doing here today, um, except we are this duplicating machine, this polygraph. Activities on the outside create neuro copies on the inside written with plasticity ink. This is almost, you would look at that and go, yeah, I understand exactly. When it comes to what we talked about earlier, the enriched uh, environment, the, um, uh, the 10 principles of neuroplasticity, it is all these activities provide the stimulus that, in, that uh, bind the uh, nerves together and they become on the inside what the outside has been trying to create. And that's how it works. Do you have any questions on that one? Because that's always pretty interesting to me that that is exactly how it works. As we were mentioning before, anything we were talking about, the, the being able to pronounce the word indicatable, whatever it is, I have to go back and look at it. But all of us, you're sing, saying it to yourself, say, ah, I do or don't know that word, but I'll work on that based on what you're now creating that, that structure in the representation and the neural representation of every spoken word. These circuits or networks can be considered a neurological counterpart of spoken word form. Neurophysiology evidence for the existence of such memory chasings for spoken, spoken words has been reported many in, in a number of studies. Uh, basically, there is this uh, word form, spoken word form that becomes the uh, neural rep rep representation. Uh, this one here in particular, oops, sorry. Oh, how did that happen? Um, is this uh, spinner that we've all had when we were kids. And we all know when we were on those kids, we were all kids and we would push and push and push. And pretty soon when, when, while pushing, then we realized, oh, we, there's not so much effort. Now we just do this, right? Push, push, push. If, stops, if you stop pushing, it'll stop spinning. So we just did that all the time with our other kids. We'd be talking, doing all kinds of things. Our parents would be watching, um, but somebody would keep doing this to keep it spinning, right? Sometimes speed it up, sometimes it would come down, but it is uh, the same way with the brain. This co continuous cognitive push is needed to keep and sustain the neuro machinery spinning every day. The, all of us know if you are a runner or just a walker, I walk, five to six miles a day. If there's a lot of rain, I don't miss it for a day or two. Really, one day, I can feel it. Two days, I'm not so happy. Three days, oh, what a tragedy it's gonna be to try to get back up to speed again. Um, the same thing happens on, on almost anything you can think of. Um, so uh, I have my um, uh, ground, ground, grandson who has CP, and he comes here every Monday through Friday at four for an hour after school and for, for the first week or two in school, he didn't wanna come. And finally, my son, his dad said, yeah, you gotta do it. And sure enough, now it's two weeks into it. And I have to say every single day because for sure he was forgetting what he was or wasn't doing the day before or two days before. So you have to keep spinning. And it's a great metaphor for how the brain has to work. It cannot be what it needs to be without doing these principles, including the repetition of this uh, constant push. And the article talks about homework is more than just homework because typically we try not to do our homework. A lot of people try not to. Uh, but the universally ad 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 admitted fact that any sequence of mental action, uh, which has been frequently repeated, tends to perpetuate itself so that we find ourselves automatically prompted to think, feel, or do what we have done before custom to think, feel, or do under like circumstances without any consciously formed purpose or anticipation of results. And this is James in 1889, 87, talking about what we just talked about. Uh, and he put in those italicis, you know, they feel, think, feel, and do. Um, it takes homework. It takes that con con continuous push, a tendency to act only 
becomes effectively ingrained in us in proportion to the uninterrupted frequency with which, now back to the intensity Bob talked about, with which the actions actually occur and the brain grows to its use. The next result is that habit diminishes the conscious attention with which our actions are performed. The more you do, the more you do with less, less effort. And we'll see another slide coming up with that exact thing. Um, if you've ever used uh, decoupage before, I don't know if anybody has, but my mom and my grandmother did this all the time. So when I was a kid, they would mail uh, letters when they were on travel. Um, my mom and grandmother were born and grew up in the Philippines. So after the war, um, they came to the United States and then went, and went back uh, all over the world. But I got those stamps and I would save them all. And eventually my mom made that box. And over all those years, um, I, all I could remember was the repetition of a decoupage was applying the, the uh, varnish, varnish and then sanding, the varnish and then sanding 40, 50, 60, 70 times. Mentally, I thought that that's what she was doing. Then after my stroke, I thought, well, this whole thing about the brain, um, it turns out that you just apply the stimulus every single day, whatever it might be. Um, and that is where the learning starts, but it has to be done. It has to be sanded down. That's the consolidation component if you read about that. So you have to actually apply and then you sand it down. Then it becomes um, what it is going forward. And that's what that looks like. The stamps under the glass, it scarcely in, indeed admits of doubt that every state of ideation, uh, consciousness, which is either very strong or is habitually repeated, leaves an engorgic impression on the serum, in virtue of which that same state may be reproduced at any future time in response to a suggestion fitted to excite it. Yes. And then saying the um, uh, this is, this is a metaphor about the plateau. Uh, you probably have heard it before, often with people with stroke and aphasia, that you have now reached your plateau. Um, uh, sadly, that is the way it's described by plenty of people, um, when in fact, the, the plateau, there's all kinds of reasons why there could be a plateau, which is really nothing more than a waste, waste place along the way. So I say here, people with aphasia cannot not learn at every stage. That is the illusion of having reached uh, one's plateau when the plateau is, is just a waypoint way on the clean climb upward. Um, although uh, there are reasons for why people would otherwise think that you are plateaued, you'll read that from my, from my article. Um, but this is also very important because as long as you are learning, meaning as long as you're alive, you are learning. And I have met people that are mute, that still have a difficulty, but are no longer quite as mute. I've met met other people who are mute and now can speak fluently after being mute for seven years. So it takes sometimes a long time. Otherwise, the rest of your life to do what you have to do. Spontaneous uh, recovery is the first stage. Again, you'll get this out of that article, but the loss of function during stroke is due partly to the neurological death in the infarcted tissue, but also to cell dysfunction in the areas surrounding the infarct. These areas incur, encompass the part of the underperfused. Yes, I know I have too many words that many people don't know about, so I'm sorry about that. Um, the penumbrum, which is really the shadow that survived the insult, the non-ischemic uh, tissue and remote brain areas that are connected to the area of tissue damage. When you read the the article you will see what I'm really talking about is that there is a tremendous loss of function uh, by cells that are still alive and living. They just have been shocked so that they have this dysfunction and it takes time for them to basically sort of wake back up and go forward. And that is all part of this, the spontaneous recovery, otherwise called uh, diastasis in Greek. So it's even more difficult. Um, but 
that is just the first stage. But unfortunately, people think the first stage is spontaneous recovery because it happens fairly quickly and it's all by nature. There's no therapeutic component of that, it's just the way the body works. And, and then, so things are happening and then it comes down and people think, because you're going down, that means you're coming at, a, at, a, at the end, when in fact, you're just coming down to a new place from which then you shift and start to go forward again, but with a, obviously a much lower uh, uh, rate of improvement compared to the spontaneous recovery going forward. Brain topiary, um, as I say here too, this is just one more thing coming to understand that just like this uh, metaphorically of that uh, garden with that um, plant tree looking like a brain, our brain works the exact same way in terms of really understanding how the brain works in this incredible com complicated device. I'm going a little bit faster because we're coming to the Q&A time. Um, shaping the networks of the brain. Uh, the, the, the scientists do talk about shaping the network in that way. Um, the standard de definition of an enriched environment is a combination of complex inanimate and social stimulation. This definition implies that the, the relevance of single con contributing factors cannot be easily isolated, but there are good reasons to assume that that is the interaction of factors that is an essential element of an enriched environment, not any single element that is hidden in the, complex, in the complexity. And what they're really saying is that um, sometimes people think that if you do uh, your therapy here today, that tomorrow you're gonna get better based on that one half an hour or hour of therapy. And that's not the way it works. Uh, there's, it's too integrated. We can say any number of things, but you have the rest of your world coming into you, it goes into the brain, it integrates all of that, and it makes certain other uh, decisions that help with your behavioral um, uh, changing, but it doesn't happen just because of this one thing here that somehow over here you'll get some, somehow better. It doesn't work that way. Um, it really is hidden, um, but it still works the same way. And this, the daily alchemy of neuroplasticity, really this is the last, uh, oh, sorry, not the last one, but it is really the last one, um, where the, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, plasticity works based on, I say here, the magical chant, but really it is the day-to-day -day chant of being able to read, write, and speak uh, as the cognitive activities that are needed and therapeutic, um, even if they are badly done, uh, as I've tried to do here, not being as good as I would like to be, um, but it is all of those things that really convert uh, and turn uh, 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 thought into thoughtful expressions. What were you thinking before but couldn't express, and now you can express for the first time. Where the, I say, where the words bloom again, the nat nature of the nerve impulse, the properties of the cell contacts as one-way gates compelling all one-way traffic on nerve paths, the occurrence of not only of action, but of active suppression of action, the knowledge that intensity of action means not larger impulses, but more free frequent impulses. The impulse effects can sum or cancel that there are places where impulses spontaneously arrive. arrive. Um, what I meant to say there, and I should have cut off some of this, basically it is the summing up uh, of all that activity, whether it be the, the therapist and any number of other things that hopefully you can do on your own, all of that becomes can be summed up and become what it now needs to be going forward on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Again, as a shipbuilder, um, I always thought about this. <laughs> this is before the stroke. It was only after when I realized, after my stroke, when I realized how so many things in the physical world um, metaphorically can help me understand how the brain really does work um, when it came to our language having lost so much. When you talk about so much of these millions of cells gone and realizing that 
you can't get there with just the 15 hours of therapy that I got in my conventional um, four months uh, sessions um, because you have to build that structure because it has to be sustainable uh, to alter the ship of state or the ship in this case of a big ship where the rudders are so big that you actually have rudders within the rudder uh, just to uh, change the movement of the rudder itself. And then that drives the inertia of a huge ship in front of you. So the speech therapists start the sustainable component of the therapeutic equipment needed for the long journey towards recovery. They are the rudder within the rudder, helping steer the ship with the interest, support, and stimulation that is needed. But you need that at the beginning, but you still have to realize that there's so much more has to come after uh, therapy leaves. And they are just the trim tab for you going forward. As it says, the neurological changes that are, that are needed to repair one's language do not appear overnight. They happen gradually based on the long-term constant plasticity-induced pressure and resultant change brought about by constant language activities. Okay. Yeah, this sort of gets to the end. The five rules of the speech language pathology, the five rules are motivation, Practice, 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 practice. Those are their five rules. I believe in those five rules. Um, and motivation is really uh, more than half the battle, as I say here with the little engine that could read that article and you see what I was talking about that, uh, that, I, think I, that I think I can thought is more than half the battle. You're reading that. I'm going to keep on going without reading it for you because we're running out of time. All right, I'm going to miss some of these because I've been going too far. We talked about that. Okay. We actually talked about this as well. Um, coming to the end, um, uh, you get to see this. The, it's the same process. Plasticity is the same process, whether you're learning or with therapy. And really, therapy is learning, and learning is therapy. Um, educating the wider public about aphasia, we just happen to be the key to understanding how aphasia is, re is recovered um, as, uh, it is, as the key to understanding how plasticity works for all other people without a stroke necessarily about how, work, how learning works as a foundation for all learning. And in what I do now with uh, all of this activity is really this uh, outreach, trying to help people understand at various venues around the country to help people understand how the brain works. And yes, happen to be stroke and aphasia per people, but we're not here to just tell you how wonderful we are to get better. It's helpful to do that, but now we are turning that around to say, for you, it's better to understand how your brain works. We just happen to be a good example of how our brain does get better based on this thing called plasticity. So uh, obviously the National Phase Association is huge in terms of providing information to the wider public, as do I through Stroke Educator with all of our, my uh, books, videos, and material. Um, but educating your local community as you have done here with the, uh, the uh, Chesapeake Forum is a great, great, great example where you are interested because you had people in your family that have uh, had a hard time with stroke in the last recent past and got people like myself to come and talk about how the brain works and how one can get better based on plasticity. So uh, you have given us this opportunity to educate your local community. I know that you reached out to get other people to help as well. Um, so I would you know, continue to say thank you very much for doing that at uh, the uh, uh, Chesapeake Forum, Forum. And if you can do that in the future using us uh, in any way possible, that would be very, very helpful. As I say, in any venue, because I've spoken at hospitals, churches, high school, grammar school, uh, businesses, you name it, uh, because everybody wants to know more about how the brain works. And this happens to be a very good way to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So I really do appreciate that. Thank you very much. 
Well, we really thank you. I do want to mention to um, those of you who are joined us a little bit later in the program, you mentioned uh, the, the um, articles that you sent out. Those are in the reminder that we sent you at 1130 this morning. Uh, you may not have noticed it. You had your Zoom link and then underneath it was a link that goes to a, um, goes to a, a site that we created in Google Drive that has all of these articles. They're listed under, they're in a folder. You'll see the two stroke articles that Nicole gave us and that from the first session, and then you'll see a folder and that has the 13 articles that Tom was talking about. You can, you can download them to your own computer or you can simply open them and read them as you go. Thank you. Well, uh, we have a, some minutes for uh, some closing questions and so before I make uh, some closing remarks. So who has the first question? I'll go. My name is Jose, Jose Maldonado. Uh, I've had most, most stroke of over 20 years. And Nicole knows me very well. Uh, and one thing that I'll say is God bless Dr. Brossard. Um, I wish that I would have met you 20 years ago when I had mine. Um, um, but practically everything you said, I've had to learn basically on, my, on myself from. I'm still learning. Mm. Um, uh, but uh, I also speak to groups uh, through, throughout the, the U.S., uh, even down in Puerto Rico. And that was one of my advantages, that I was fully bil bilingual. I've been bilingual since I was a child. And so, but I couldn't, when I, could, when I couldn't find, find the words in English, I needed, so I would, say, I would actually say them in Spanish, say, hoping, praying that the people I'm talking to you know, <laughs> would make sense out of it. But um, I gradually, you know, that that helped me, yeah. Uh, and so, but uh, I mean, I, I mean, this is the first time I've heard of you, you know. Um, uh, believe me, I'm going to start going to a lot of your, your, your uh, writings and whatnot. Um, but uh, uh, but I just wish that more doctors uh, would have your experience, you know. Obviously, I don't, I don't wish them to have the, to go to get there the way you have. You know, but I think that, uh, it, you know, I, I, I just wish that the doctors out there could could learn uh, what you've learned, you know, uh, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we can stay in touch going oh, forward. Oh, um, oh, you can count on it. We can count on that. Well, <laughs> yeah. that'd be wonderful. Yeah, and Nicole, Nicole knows me, and, I, and I, 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 I speak to several groups down in Miami. Uh, New Jersey, Colorado, Chicago, um, um, and I've been doing this uh, all my all my life on my own. Uh, and 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 to, to hear somebody like yourself, you know, saying the exact same things that I'm saying, you know, yeah. uh, obviously a little more uh, uh, different way you want that. Um, but uh, it, I mean, you, you're such a breath of fr fresh air. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And have you met? Darlene, she's she's still there. You there, Darlene? I'm here. Um, it's Doreen. Yes. Doreen. <laughs> um, yes, I work with Dr. Uh, Browser also, and Jose. I'm from Puerto Rico also. Ah, uh -huh, bien. I have what? aphasia, and I well, I had my stroke in Puerto Rico oh, nine years ago, and it was a nightmare. And Good. I was locked in for three years. So I know exactly what you're saying. Well, well, um, well I've, I've, I've talked to, to several doctors groups in Puerto Rico because mm -hmm. I didn't find any uh, uh, stroke support groups down there. And so, they aren't. Uh, yes. and so one of the things that I, that I plan to do, uh, I retire uh, this year, um, December, but one of my things I want, want, want to do is to go down there and help to form uh, different support groups support groups yes well that's wonderful i mean they need it desperate desperately and now because of the pandemic and everything it's yeah. been very yeah. difficult we dr browser myself and our organizational national aphasia association we have been very involved obviously because we have aphasia but also yeah. 
because um, we're we're open opening the the doors uh, mm -hmm. to, to other groups and people that have aphasia with different languages also. So in my case, for example, I am also um, have been this whole two years now um, uh, doing international work in different languages. Okay, in Spanish and English and in Portuguese and from from Spain all the way down to Argentina and it's wonderful because we all have the same the same uh, uh, needs exactly as we have right here right now everyone okay. around the world it's amazing well I mean I think that by having somebody like Dr. Broussard you know uh, kind of leading the way you know uh, That'll uh, add to at least the efforts that, that I do because uh, uh, I, 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 always, I always want to point to somebody other than myself, you know, uh, mm -hmm. who's, who uh, uh, sorts of, of nods, you know, that can testify a, a lot of the things that I've been, experienced and whatnot. And now I, and now I have that, that, that source. So a thank new friend. You. Just yes. a new friend. <laughs> yes. Tom. Yeah. And Darlene, I always I mispronounce Darlene's first name. Every uh, day, huh? every day, he <laughs> every day you say it's Doreen. My name is Doreen, but you you do it because our the president of National Aphasia Association, she is Darlene, and we're always confused. <laughs> Everybody does it. Is no worries. Yes, but. well, I got to keep working on that since we're also good friends. Yes, I'm, I'm very grateful for Dr. Browse, and I just want to let everybody know that today, his birthday was yesterday, the day before yesterday, and yeah, stroke, stroke, and stroke, his, stroke, yes. his stroke birthday, <laughs> exactly, right. 10 you. years ago also, yes, we're so proud of him and very, very grateful for everything he does every day, amazing, and thank you everybody in the che che Chesapeake Fordham. I'm sorry, I have aphasia. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. I've been I've been watching for the the two weeks, and it's been beautiful. Thank you so much. Nicole. Well, you are quite welcome. I do have a question, Tom. Sometimes when you're talking about aphasia, sometimes it sounds as if your brain is starting over, mm -hmm. and it makes me wonder why is it that children can learn things so quickly, but we have such difficulty when we have so many other things in our brain that aren't, aren't connecting. Well, that would be another class. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. the, there, but there are some interesting things, of course, with the, um, uh, as you get older, the brain does obviously assume a tremendous, a, a tremendous amount of ingrained, 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 um, networks. They are set. You know, it's like you want to vote for one person. You don't want to have to vote for that other person. And that's, that's your habit. You're never going to change your mind, as it were, uh, when you're a kid. Um, and you're really still dealing with images um, with the kids. They just think of the world, as it were, without really knowing that if you step onto that world, you could get run over. Um, so it does take, they learn a lot earlier. Uh, but still have to grow into being becoming more judicious going forward, as it were. Uh, but it does take a, uh, an interesting thing because when you're younger, you have tw twice as many cells as you and I do, also. So they uh, the uh, so that too is this uh, shaping of the brain and sculpting mm -hmm. the brain and pruning the brain up through you know, six, seven, eight years old kids also. But yeah, longer, longer discussion of that. But a good question. So I had a question. I had a question too. Uh, are the number of cells that one has always, uh, the, the sheer number of cells um, growing, shrinking, et cetera, et cetera. So let's suppose a young person has X cells. You, you said something about twice as many twice cells. As many. Mm -hmm. An older person say, right. so is there a, a, a diagram of the um, 
the life of uh, brain cells. And when uh, an event happens and you lose some of them, you say you've got a hundred, you got a trillion of them and you lose a million. Well, a million is nothing right. compared to a trillion. Right. So um, does that number, suppose the brain cells, do the cells keep growing or do they regenerate or what happens? I mean, who, sure. wh where does the supply come from and how does it fluctuate? Sure. Um, the uh, humans, most adults have about a hundred billion cell neurons. So neurons, those are the most important ones. There's a, another many, many, many more cells that actually support them, structurally support them and so on, about a hundred million uh, neurons. They, when, when we had kids, they had 200 million. So those cells go away. They actually absorb that information as they start to build the new networks going forward. Um, the interesting thing about the answer to your question is that the remaining cells you have, either because of a stroke or just as you get older, you actually do start to lose cells. But to answer your question of do you continue to grow, the answer, interestingly, is yes, even though you're losing your cells. Well, how can that be? It's because the remaining cells have that capacity based on the stimulus that will grow more branches and leaves, more dendrites and synapses. So you can learn new things even if you have lost certain cells because those cells are never gonna come back. Although there, scientifically, there are some ways that there are some additional cells that can be created, but we don't have to worry about that. It really is this plasticity capacity to grow more branches and leaves with the remaining cells you have. So if I had lost, pick a number, a million cells, they're gone, never gonna come back, but the remaining cells grow addition, the additional parts of the learning fields that allows, allows me now able to speak when I couldn't speak before. So is that an argument for uh, Chesapeake Forum and concerning continued learning? Um, because I, I think that uh, the uh, universe of people who are signing up for Chesapeake Forum is interesting because they're older people and they want to continue to learn. Yeah. But now we have new reasons for supporting the Chesapeake Forum. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. I, I think I also thought of my grandmother, who was a fantastic knitter mm. and crocheter. Mm. all her life. And she would be, carry on a full conversation with numerous people while her fingers were moving like crazy the whole right. time. Right. And she was knitting sweaters for grandchildren, great grandchildren. She lived to 97 years old. Wow. And she was still talking and knitting in her wow. 96th year when I visited her last. Wow. And you've explained it to me. <laughs> yes. So she didn't, she wasn't a reader. She wasn't, she, I have all our old letters and things of this sort, but she was a knitter. So uh, it's Chesapeake Forum and knitting is the, uh, is the solution. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Charlie, thank you for that, uh, that plug. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to take a moment to, to recap a little bit of what we went through in the last two weeks. Link, could you, could you uh, mute, please? Well, I just and, wanted, I, Bob, I just wanted to add something really quickly. Um, don't forget that, that um, Tom was talking about at, um, more than just knitting, but um, phys more physical activities as well. Mm -hmm. And that speaks very well to our, um, our uh, new alignment in this winter with the YMCA. So our, our members will have a chance to be working out at the YMCA and coming upstairs for a class that will work with their brain. Yeah, the, there's some great uh, uh, work on, on learning for older people, uh, learning for everybody, basically, but basically activities and cognitive activities together, not just do one or the other, but together. And that is what provides the most push in terms of plasticity. Maybe oh. instead of chairs, we should have the little, um, the, the bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, while you're talking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I do all my walking while reading. It just turns out that I do that. I did that before the stroke and after the stroke without knowing how therapeutic that was. So in the future, uh, we, we just finished a Chesapeake Forum class by uh, Forrest Hansen on the symposium. Mm. Those guys were lying down on couches. 
So now what we ought to do is to get the YMCA bikes and put them in a circle and go. continue to a dialogue. There you go. <laughs> well, or sit on wonder... Swiss balls. <laughs> you know, those big Swiss balls. Yeah, that's exercise yeah. sitting on oh, that. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> well, allow me to recap here um, a little bit. And first of all, and following up with what Jose had to say about, you know, there are perhaps a lot of people in healthcare that don't know much about this. In fact, I sp I've spent the last four and a half decades around human clinical chemistry, um, veterinary reproduction practices. And these last two weeks really opened my eye to a lot of things, raised my awareness about brain function and how uh, stroke and aphasia recovery actually happens. You know, it's interesting how Nicole started out with the metaphor. She talked about, uh, I have all these notes today. Um, she talked about the NASCAR stroke team. Yeah. and what happens in, in the stroke center or in the ER. Um, we also um, looked at neural knitting. We talked about that. Um, the resources and the references that uh, Tom brought forth go all the way back to the 1800s. I got I to gotta look into this James guy that uh, was uh, brought up things a century and a half ago. And um, uh, Tom talked about motivation and practice times four really important thing. So I, I think that if this is really important, it's a really important subject because it impacts so many people are, in terms of our, our families and friends. Uh, this is a tuition-free offering by, tui by Chesapeake Forum. And so as you receive the links to these recordings, make them viral, share them with everybody you know. This is, this is something that's so important. And I gotta tell you, I've been around healthcare for a long time. I, my awareness before meeting Tom was was really minimal, mm -hmm. and I think that we owe it to all the people around us to share this fascinating information. Um, I'd like to um, submit to the members of the board that are attending our session today that we look at perhaps a follow-up. We can talk to Nicole and Megan and Dr. Broussard about doing a follow-up perhaps next uh, sure. uh, spring or winter. and. Um, one last thing I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Broussard is how do we resource the, the books that you've published so that we can share those with those, us, those people around us? Um, they're all on Amazon. Um, you can go to my website and that'll take you to Amazon to get all those books as well as Kindle. Um, if you need more than that in terms of other material, you can always get a hold of me and I'll see what else I can do besides those particular things. And Doreen also in the chat just just gave us um, the mm -hmm. links to the National Aphasia Association as well as the link for the Stroke Education right. Association. I guess that's an or in incorporation. Um, so if you want to grab those and paste them somewhere, that would be a good idea too. Um, if there's Dr. Broussard, if there's any. Um, a list of books, for example, or or associate you. Know, if you have something like that that you would like us to to add to the um, information that we put into into um, Google Docs, um, feel free to get that out to me, and I will put that in that folder. Okay. okay. Yeah. The um, all right. I can do that too. The um, yeah. When I start, yeah. I'm going to stop talking because people, even before the stroke, we end up going around the barn. After the stroke, you really go around the barn. So <laughs> when you start asking that question, I'm about to go off in another going around the barn, and I won't do that to you guys. Next time, I'm going to get rid of a couple of those metaphor uh, slides because that was too many, too many of the 13. took a long time. Well, yeah, but you have to keep the ones that make you really have to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I must say that it, it's unfortunate we have to call and uh, draw this this session to an end um, because there's so many other questions and things that we could talk about. Um, I like to say that uh, to you, Tom, I am honored to call you a friend and a classmate. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks well, to everything. Thank Thanks to the Chesapeake Forum. Yep. Thank you, everybody. It's been thank a great you. two sessions. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Take care. Ha, <laughs>